We wanted to give you the perspective of uh, different leadership uh, ideas about the SDGs and to get an NGO perspective. And uh, Kevin Watkins is the CEO of Save the Children. Um, many of us in the room have worked with Save the Children, including ourselves at Relics Group. And uh, I also know that Kevin is a customer of ours in a sense because, and he's one of our of our authors. And actually, today we have uh, released, as you know, the SDG Resource Center, and you can find one of Kevin's articles that has been chosen on the site. Um, Kevin joined Save the Children in September 2016 after spending three years as executive director of the Overseas Development Institute. Previously, he held a senior academic role at the Brookings Institution and acted as an advisor to the UN Special Envoy for Education. Uh, he also has been involved with UNESCO uh, and UNDP. Uh, he's a senior visiting research fellow at Oxford University's Center for Global Economic Governance and a visiting professor of international development at the London School of Economics. So without further ado, over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much. I, I feel I also ought to thank the inventor of the Dyson air conditioning system. Because actually walking into this room is just a massive relief from coming from the outside. I did want to start just by taking a step back and asking people to reflect on what the SDGs are all about. Uh, and I think for all of us who work in the sector and are engaged in dialogue about the SDGs, we, we can sometimes lose sight of what's at stake because it, you know, it's become like a mini institution in its own right. And we sometimes forget the purpose and the meaning of institutions. And in the case of the SDGs, that, that's easy to do because there's quite a lot of them, you know, the 17, and then there's 169 targets. And if you think back to the MDGs, you know, we had a small number of them. See, Jim Wolfenson used to get everybody in the World Bank to carry on their card the, the MDGs, and you could fit them on a card. If you tried to do that with the SDGs, you know, you need a mini library to carry around with you. So, but the purpose of the SDGs, I think, is reflected in the title. And the, the, the first three words of the title, uh, transforming our world. And that is not just a slogan, because if you look at what's at stake and what is set out in the 17 goals, you know, think of the goals 13 and 14 on our oceans and climate change. You know, th this is about our obligations to our children. It's not an abstract target. It's about the world that we will hand over to them. It's about us deciding, do we want to hand them over a world with an unpayable ecological debt, with a deteriorating natural environment? Or do we want to hand them over a world in which they can be secure and build a secure future for their children? So one of the things the SDGs are about are intergenerational justice, our obligations to the next generation. They're also about our more immediate obligations to people who, as we hold this meeting here, uh, are running the risk of illness or premature death as a result of avoidable illness, kids who are out of school or have no prospect of learning, and people who are really at the sharp end of the opportunity divide. And when I think about, when, you know, when I'm trying to explain the SDGs to people who are probably not as steeped in them as all of you or, or even my colleagues in Save the Children, I, I think of the, what, what I call the three E's. And these are eradicating extreme poverty and hunger. You know, we're in a world where almost a billion people go to bed at night hungry because they don't have enough money. You know, that is a shocking indictment of the world we're in. So that's the first E. The second E is ending avoidable child deaths. You know, the six million children who don't live to see their fifth birthday, who die from many different things, diarrhea, pneumonia, measles. But what they're really dying from is poverty and hunger. So it's about justice and a future for those children. And the third E is about extending opportunity. You know, again, we live in a world 
where 60 million children are out of school, where there are 250 million children who are either out of school or in school but not learning very basic literacy and numeracy skills, the skills that could equip them to break the transmission of poverty and disadvantage across generations. And the guiding principle that's at the heart of the Sustainable Development Goals and is set out in the preamble is actually reflected you know, pe people, everybody knows about the language of leave no one behind. But in that same paragraph, what it says is that we will endeavour to ensure that progress is fastest for those who are furthest from the goals. Now, I suspect many governments signed up for the SDGs without reading the small print. Because that is not, is what, that is not what is happening in the world, which is becoming increasingly unequal, increasingly fragmented. But if we want to achieve the targets, and, and I'll come back to this in a moment, failure to act on the spirit and the letter of that provision to close the gaps between the most advantaged and the disadvantaged is the wrecking train for the Sustainable Development Goals. We, we will not achieve the goals unless we strengthen our focus on inequality and the gap between the most advantaged and the least advantaged. Our founder, actually, Eglantine Jeb, one, once said the way you judge a community is not by its wealth, but by the way it treats its children. And I would say the Sustainable Development Goals set out a moral standard for how we should discharge our responsibilities to children uh, and act on their behalf. So for me, the Sustainable Development Goals are really right at the heart of our mission in Save the Children. They're, they're at the heart of everything that we stand for as an organisation and our, our values. Now, if you look at where we need to get to for the Sustainable Development Goals and where we're starting from, um, you know, you'd be tempted to recite that, that old quip about, you know, somebody asks somebody else the way to the station. And the answer is, well, if you want to get to the station, you don't start from here. But we do start from here. And it's, it's very easy when you look at the distance between where we need to get to and where we are to either feel a sense of despair or a sense of inertia because, you know, we are an awful long way from the target. And we've only got 15 years to go. That's not a long time. But if you look at it through the other end of the telescope of what we've achieved over the last 15 years, we've achieved the greatest reduction in poverty in a 15-year period in recorded history. We've cut child deaths over the last 15 years from almost 11 million down to just under 6 million. We've increased the prospects of children born in the poorest countries reaching their fifth birthday by 40%. That's unprecedented. You know, who would have said 15 years ago that countries like Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Mozambique, Nepal would be setting a standard for progress towards the Millennium Development Goals? Extraordinary things are possible in human development when governments and social movements and business put their hand to the wheel. And so my starting point is that these goals are achievable. But we have to be honest and recognise that if we carry on as we are, they will not be achieved. And I'll just give you a couple of simple illustrations of why that's the case. Take the goal of child survival. We, we know that on our current trajectory, the current rate of progress, that we will miss the Sustainable Development Goal target by around 3 million child deaths, 3 million avoidable child deaths. Around 600,000 of those deaths will be a result of pneumonia. That's a disease that currently claims almost a million lives every year. But unlike malaria, unlike measles, unlike some of the other major killers, Death rates for pneumonia are falling incredibly slowly. And yet, there's no global partnership really driving the agenda on pneumonia. The kids who are dying don't have access to the most basic of technologies, the most basic of medicines. So our challenge is how do we 
ensure that health systems don't leave these kids behind. That's not a technical problem. That's about politics, it's about policy design, and it's about commitment. Another example, take the case of education. We currently have 60 million children out of school, as I said before, and that's a lot fewer than we had back in 2000, when there were almost 100 million out of school. But that number's not coming down. It's, it's flatlined. And even worse than that, the learning indicators, as more and more children get into school, have also flatlined. So, you know, you go to a typical rural school in Pakistan and you speak to a grade five child in that school, they will be unable to read a single sentence from a grade two textbook. That's a failure of an education system, of a teaching system. I've just been last week in northern Uganda with South Sudanese refugees. There are around half a million South Sudanese refugees of, primary, of school age in northern Uganda. The vast majority of them are out of school. Those that are in school are sitting in classrooms that have ratios of 150 kids to one teacher. There's not a textbook in sight, and they're being taught by teachers who don't speak their language. We are, through our inaction, consigning those kids to failure. And yet, where is the partnership that could address that problem? The partnership that can bring the tablets, the education technologies to these kids, that can ensure that there are teachers who speak their language, who can talk to them in the classroom. This is a failure that we can correct, but it's part of the living agenda that we need to address if we're going to act on the commitment to leave no child behind. Take a third area, um, that of child poverty. As I've already said, we've, ach we've achieved extraordinary progress in reducing poverty around the world. But the reality is that there's one part of the world which hasn't started on the demographic transition, where fertility rates are still five to six births per woman. Uh, there's one part of the world in which the under five population is growing. I'm talking about Africa. There'll be 49 million more under five children in Africa in 2030 than there are today. In every other part of the world, the numbers are coming down, both in relative and absolute terms, but these children are being born into the part of the world with the deepest poverty, the slowest economic growth, the slowest rate of poverty reduction, and 147 million of them will still be in poverty in 2030 unless we tackle the issues that they face. There's no movement, in my view at the moment, that's really addressing that challenge in the way that it needs to. So this is all about delivering on our, on our promises to children. What, the, what, what I want to end with, and I'll be very brief on this, is just a few reflections on how we tackle these challenges. And uh, I, want, I want to put four propositions to you. The, the first is that if you look at great achievements in human development, I've spoken about the period since 2000, but think also of the success we've had in combating malaria, the success we've had in combat combating AIDS. Go back in history and think about the eradication of child labor. These are advances that were achieved through unlikely coalitions by the business sector, the churches, non-government organizations and community groups coming together in unexpected coalitions and sticking together. We, th this is the coalition the type of coalition that we need to drive the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. And if I think from a purely parochial perspective, and I look at the partnerships that we have in Save the Children, the partnership that we have with GSK, which has delivered a product called chlorhexidine to women giving birth in Kenya, which is preventing sepsis. You know, we as Save the Children can't develop that product. We, what we can do is link the product to kids and mothers who are being left behind. This is an example of a partnership that can work. We have a partnership with Pearson that's trying to reach kids with education in refugee camps. They have technologies and skills and capabilities that we just don't have. 
But what we do have is the potential to link those skills and technologies to kids who desperately need them. So these are the sort of partnerships that we need. Second principle, if we're serious about leaving no one behind, it needs to be reflected in how we approach measurement and data. Take a very simple um, example. For children who are born into the richest 20% in a country like Pakistan, the rate of reduction that you need to hit the Sustainable Development Goal target of eradicating avoidable child deaths is around 2%. For children born into the poorest 20%, the rate of reduction you need is 6%, the annual rate of reduction. Now, you're not going to get to 6% unless policymakers take a very conscious decision to concentrate resources and health workers, research capabilities towards the poorest 20%. And if we don't track whether the gaps are narrowing and hold governments to account for narrowing the gaps, I assure you that the vast majority of governments in the world, whatever they say in the SDGs, will turn their back on the poor because this is not their natural constituency. We need to hold them accountable for sticking to the letter and the spirit of the SDGs, as I said right at the beginning. The third thing we need to do is form the coalitions, not just the partnerships of the type that I mentioned, but the coalitions that bring together our best thinkers, our cultural thinkers, our artists, our novelists, our business leaders, to turn this into a cause that gets the traction with the public that it needs and deserves because groups of us here however committed we are you know we on our own will never win the day on the SDGs we need a movement and in the same way that you know if you went back to the eradication of slavery to the eradication of child labor these were movements which brought together extraordinary people you know musicians and novelists and others people who made that cause a public cause and that's what we need to do with the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.